Good evening. Um, welcome, teachers of the Chronobiology Summer School. Welcome to students of the Chronobiology Summer School. Welcome to colleagues from Oxford, and welcome to ladies and gentlemen from the public in Oxford. Um, you've made a good choice coming tonight to this lecture. You're not going to be disappointed. Tonight you're going to hear Professor Russell Foster speak here at home about his research topic, um, light, sleep, and circadian rhythms from biology to medicine. Um, my name is Martha Merrow. I work at the University of Munich, and I'm also a teacher here for this summer school. Um, it's my fifth year here, and this might be our last year in Oxford. It might not be our last year in Oxford. Um, but it's been a wonderful add-on to our summer school that we have this public lecture where, where um, the students and people from the community get to hear some kind of a translational story about real basic research that has to do with um, uh, quality of life and health. Um, tonight our speaker is Professor Russell Foster, and he is um, a professor here at Oxford. I need to tell you a little bit about Russell. He um, studied at Bristol, and then he stayed on at Bristol and did his PhD with Sir Brian Follett. Um, already getting interested in uh, photoreception and biological timing in the bird system in that case. He postdoced, uh, continuing on with the uh, photobiology theme in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Germany. And then he went on as an assistant professor. He went really far abroad to the University of Virginia, one of the top public universities in the United States which has a fantastic chronobiology group and community, um, where he was post-talking with Mike Menninger, Menninger at the uh, National Science Foundation Center for Biological Timing. And this is where he's really uh, sort of been able to realize his ambition of going further and getting into mammalian, understanding mammalian photoreception as it pertains to biological timing. And this is where he's laid the groundwork, at least, for his uh, seminal discoveries. He was in Virginia until 1995. He came back to England to Imperial College in London until 2005, and then moved to Oxford, where he's been ever since. He's been extremely successful here, getting a uh, substantial program grant to establish the SCNI, which has sponsored, on one hand, these summer schools, but set up a huge uh, working team, integrative team, to study not only uh, uh, a very discrete biological question, but translation and uh, into real uh, behavior that spans uh, experiments in his institute span all the way from uh, um, primitive animals and molecules uh, through humans in everyday life. In that sense, I would say um, Russell's really been leading our field. Our field is going through a big translational push uh, from basic science to things that are really useful for people. The biological clock is important for health and well-being um, and, um, uh, yeah, education, success in education, and uh, many other aspects, and Russell's really been out ahead of us on that. Um, in recognition of his excellence, um, as there are some little symbols that are evidence of this, and you'll see this attached to his name there. So he is a um, fellow of the Royal uh, Society of Biology. He is a fellow of the medical, society, uh, of medical sciences. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, where he um, <clears throat> boasted to me that he's, his Twitter has been very successful which reminded me of someone else whose Twitter has been very successful. And I just would like to say this is the biggest crowd that's ever been in this room. Um, but then there's another honor that which I think is particularly impressive. That's he's a commander of the British Empire, so watch what you do tonight. I obviously have no idea what that means. Um, um, I think that there, I don't want to say much more. I think we, we have a heavy lecture ahead of us. You're not going to be disappointed. I just want to say that um, um, this is this this gathering here. That the the ins the insurance that we do this every year is a sign for how committed Russell is for public engagement. There are several people people in our field who who uh, do quite a lot in this respect. Russell is certainly one of them, and um, I'm very happy that 
that Oxford, the people from Oxford can be here tonight to really take advantage of that because you're gonna hear some things that are so important for your life. And I think everyone will learn something new tonight from me to you and to the students also. Thank you so much for um, talking to us. Well, thank you very much indeed, Martha. Um, it really is a genuine uh, delight and honor to be with you all this evening. It's a, a particular delight to be here, and I'd like to um, uh, identify the summer school uh, participants, the, the young people who are going to be part of the next generation taking the science forward. Some of the questions and, and the issues I'll raise this evening will be addressed by these young people. So, so I would like them to put their hands up uh, so you can see what the next generation looks like. You'll notice they're fairly shabbily dressed. They're quite poor. Um, <laughs> So if you feel obliged to take them for a drink or some food afterwards, I'm sure that they will be most grateful. Um, so what I'd like to do this evening is sort of uh, talk about some of the work that we've been done, but to put our work into the broader context and, and address the issues of the importance of light, sleep, and circadian rhythms, how they interact, and really talk about how fundamental biology is being translated into uh, well-being and to medicine. <clears throat> I thought what we would do is cover the following few topics. Give a brief overview of circadian rhythms, these internal 24-hour body clocks, if you like. Um, then talk about the biology of sleep and circadian rhythms and how these two systems are interacting. Talking about some of the importance of sleep. And then the importance of light, which relates very much to our own research interests and, and a lot of what's going on in Oxford. And really to understand these two topics, <clears throat> that will inform our understanding of why uh, sleep and circadian rhythm disruption is so prevalent across so many aspects of our society and various health domains. And then I'll illustrate that with one specific example, with this extraordinary relationship between mental illness and sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. Why do these two systems always seem to coexist? Co and what can we, how can we think about that relationship? And what, indeed, might we want to do about it? And then with just a few slides at the end, thinking about how we can use information, particularly about how light is regulating these systems, to develop new drugs and new therapies, therapeutics to stabilize sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. And just give you a flavor of where we're going uh, towards the end. <clears throat> so let's kick off with circadian rhythms and overview. Now, these 24-hour body clocks, or these circadian clocks, meaning about a day, and sleep processes generally have really captured the popular imagination, as you will know. Um, you can't really open any sort of magazine or, or um, a newspaper without some discussion of the importance of sleep and what happens when it falls apart and what you need to do about it. We are obsessed about it. But I have to say, sometimes it's not always helpful. Sometimes, in fact, it can get a bit misleading. Um, uh, and I want to sort of illustrate that within the context of an article in the Daily Mirror. I thought you might find this amusing. So <clears throat> I worked for the Daily Mirror a few years ago on this, on this um, uh, magazine, this um, newspaper article. A time to set your body clock. Yeah, I was happy about that. Um, and I worked quite closely with Beth Gibbon, and I was very comfortable with natural rhythms rule our bodies and dictate the best times for a range of activities. And here's our countdown. That was all very fine. I have to say I was far less comfortable with the following statement. 10 a.m., have a bikini wax. <coughs> <laughs> or an injection, or a visit to the dentist. Basically anything with an ouch factor. Now this is in quotations. Pain intensity is at its lowest between 8 and 10 a.m., says Professor Russell Foster. And still in quotations, it's not entirely clear why, but it's probably because pain receptors aren't as alert as they are later in the day. Now I promise you I didn't say that. Um, <clears throat> and I certainly didn't say 6.30 p.m. heralds the start of two and a half hours of <clears throat> sex and booze. So if in about 25 minutes you're feeling a bit frisky, um, <laughs> you'll know the reason why. Um, and of course what all this nonsense, do nonsense does is refer to some truly extraordinary biology. And, and of course, just to state the obvious, we sit on this, this extraordinary planet that revolves once every 24 hours. And of course, this revolution of the Earth on its axis transforms our environment to the day-night cycle. And in response to the day-night cycle, every aspect of our biology changes and adapts to these very, very different demands of the day-night. And of course, in us, 
It relates to the processes of sleep and the processes of consciousness and the complexity of the biology that underpins sleep and indeed the waking state and consciousness. So every aspect of what we are and what we do is adjusted by an internal clock to these varying demands of this rotation of the Earth on its axis. And let's have a look at some of those changes. So in each of these, these graphs here, you see a 24-hour time base from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then a change in the physiological parameter on this axis. And the gray area represents broadly when we're asleep. And if we just take the first example, which is core body temperature, and we see that core body temperature is relatively high during the day, it drops during sleep, but then look at this, it's rising in anticipation of increased metabolic demands, the need for a higher metabolic rate, um, and so it's rising uh, in anticipation of getting up, it's high throughout the day, and then it drops again. Actually, this drop in core body temperature is probably quite important in sleep initiation. If you block that drop in core body temperature, it's more difficult to go to sleep. Now, the key point about this phenomena and the other phenomena I'm going to show you, and we can see a whole range of them here, Here's changes in blood pressure, which we'll talk about, changes in alertness. Growth hormone is fascinating. Our growth hormone, it's not simply a hormone that drives growth, but it's also cell repair and, and, and dealing with tissue damage, is almost exclusively released during the first part of the night and the first part of the sleep phase. The, the stress hormone cortisol is rising up in anticipation of increased activity, and of course the biggie, the 24-hour rhythm in sleep and wake. Now the key point is that if you or I went to a deep, dark cave, constant light, constant temperature, these rhythms would broadly continue. They are, in us, a little bit longer than 24 hours, so they'll tend to drift through time, but they persist under constant conditions. So they're driven by an internal body clock or this circadian clock. So the circadian system adjusts or fine-tunes physiology and behavior to the profound yet predictable demands of the 24-hour day-night cycle. And let's look at some of the implications of this dynamic 24-hour biology. So let's consider blood pressure and alertness. Uh, so what's very striking is that our blood pressure, ideally, during the day is around about 130. It drops in at, over sleep and it rises to a low point of around about 70. It then rises uh, in anticipation of getting more oxygen, more nutrients to the muscles and the rest of the tissues of the body for increased activity during the wake state. But there's a very sharp rise in that blood pressure there. And my colleague in Oxford, uh, Peter Rothwell, has looked at the incidence of stroke. So you have the frequency of stroke on this axis and the time base along here. And you see that there's a very sharp rise. Indeed, the chance of having a stroke between 6 a.m. and 12 noon is almost 50% 50, 50 higher than at any other time of day. So um, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us some important things about the biology, but it also can help us inform our healthcare services. So when should we be taking our stroke medication? Many of us, of course, will be getting up, wandering around, and be taking it actually in this window here, where there's the greatest chance of having a stroke. In fact, what we should really be doing is finding ways of taking it in this window here prior to that dangerous zone when stroke is going to kick in. It also suggests that we should um, prepare our healthcare services, knowing that there's that 50% uh, increase that peak in stroke at this particular time of day. What can we do to prepare our hospitals and our ambulances to deal with that higher frequency of strokes? So there's a good example where biology can translate into when you should take your medication and indeed how we can prepare our healthcare services. In fact, overall, um, 6 a.m. and 12 noon is, is the most dangerous time. Uh, so, uh, so tomorrow, when you look at your watch and you see it's it's 12 noon, you can have a vague sigh of relief because you've, you've survived the most dangerous part of the day, that, that, that rise in all of these, these, these things that precipitate um, uh, problems. The other uh, parameter I'd like to illustrate here is uh, cognitive performance, our ability to process information. And so here we see sort of the average at zero, and this is the drop in our ability to process information. And this is time of day along here.
And what you see is that it's, during the day, it's fairly stable. Sometimes there's a bit of a dip, and of course, it'll depend on whether you're a morning person or an evening person. But around about 10 o'clock, our uh, ability to perform cognitive tasks drops absolutely dramatically. It goes to a low level of about minus 20 in the early hours of the morning. Then again, the clock increases our cognitive, import, import, um, uh, uh, our cognitive performance in anticipation of needing to function to process information. Now, what's this dotted line? What's absolutely fascinating is the dotted line represents the uh, drop in performance when you're legally drunk. So if you've had a few whiskeys and, and, and a few beers, then, of course, you're going to have a cognitive decline. And at this point here, you're legally drunk. And what's extraordinary, of course, is that your ability to perform tasks at 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning is worse than if you consume sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. So if you take nothing from this presentation, the fact that if you're driving a car at this early hours of the day, these early hours of the day, be aware your ability to drive that car is worse than if you got into the vehicle drunk. It's very important to appreciate that. And, and the reason I stress this is because the tired brain is so tired, it can't detect how tired it is. So you think you're okay, but actually your ability to function is massively impaired. And, of course, this correlates uh, accounting for traffic volume for the highest chance of having a road traffic accident in those early hours of the morning. So the circadian system adjusts or fine-tunes physiology. We've said that. Um, let's look at some further implications. And this is the circadian timing of drug delivery. We've kind of touched on this already, but I just wanted to show you some really fascinating da data. We've known since the 1960s and these are studies in mice. And these mice were exposed to a bacterial toxin. And they were exposed to the same dose. And you look at the percent of mortality on this axis here. So you see, if the uh, bacteria were, or the toxin was exposed to the mice here, you got greater than 80% of death. Whereas if you exposed them to the toxin here, it was uh, less than uh, well, greater than 20% of death. So you see huge variation in death. Same dose, um, same toxin, different times of day have a profoundly different toxic effect upon the mouse. And that's important, and it's worth bearing that in mind, because, of course, we know that responses will vary at different times of the day, and I'll illustrate that uh, with a few examples from us in a moment. But, of course, currently drug testing is performed on nocturnal rodents, uh, and we extrapolate it to ourselves, um, and we're a diurnal species. So what we're doing is we're waking up mice here from their sleep phase, exposing them to a toxin or whatever, a drug, and then extrapolating it to our wake phase. Um, and I don't think we're really taking our drug test testing suitably seriously. We should be taking time of day and diurnality and nocturnality into account. And we currently don't really do that in many areas of the pharmaceutical industry. So time of day is important. And let me illustrate that further. Again, I'm giving you old examples to show you how long this information has been around. This is 93, a famous study by Rivard. And he was looking at childhood leukemia using this particular chemotherapy. And these kids were either given the chemotherapy uh, in the morning or in the evening. And those kids that had the uh, dosing in the evening had a two and a half uh, fold greater chance of remission than those that had the drug in the morning. Same drug, different time of day, big effects upon long-term survival. And to illustrate that with a very modern example, this is a, a quite sobering study that was published uh, in 2016. And this uh, study addressed whether uh, brain radiotherapy uh, would have an impact upon survival in patients with multiple uh, tumors throughout the brain. And the data, as I say, are quite extraordinary. There were three groups, and they were all around the same age group. One group had the, uh, the radiotherapy 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., the next 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and the final group, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then if you look down here, you look at how long it took them to die from the initiation of the radiotherapy. Those people who had the morning therapy were all dead by six months. Those that had it the, the, the midday, let's say, early afternoon, 
there was, they all were dead by 24 months. Uh, but those that had the afternoon therapy, there were still, I think, one or two people alive by 36 months. So again, same drug or same treatment, in this case radiotherapy, different times of day had a profoundly different impact upon long-term survival. And we don't take this sort of information sufficiently into account in our healthcare services. And this is something that we really need to change. Okay. So let's now move on to that most extraordinary of our 24-hour behaviors, and that's the cycle of sleep and, 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 and wake. So the biology of sleep and circadian rhythms. And again, I want to put sleep into some sort of a context. This is a sort of a pie chart showing what we do over the 24-hour day, and it's based upon some American studies. And work and work-related activities for this group who are between 25 and 54, and they have children. So about 37% of the waking day is associated with work and related activities, so the commute to and from work. If we then slice up the rest of the day, leisure and sport, 10%. Household activities, 4.2%. Eating and drinking is a surprisingly small amount, only 4.2%. Um, caring for others, 5%. Um, a whole bunch of other activities. But the remaining segment, of course, is the one that's so powerful, which is, uh, for this age group, 32% of their activities will be sleep. And across the lifespan, that increases to 36%. So 36% of our entire lives will be spent asleep. And that statistic alone must tell us that sleep at some level is important. And I just want to put that 36% into uh, some sort of a context as well. Anybody here about to celebrate has celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary? No? Yes, fantastic. Well, I think the gentleman there needs to be aware that um, of those 60 years, 21 and a half of those years, you were asleep with your partner. And so I'm, I, I question whether you can take full credit for that 60 years. So, so when you cut the cake, maybe we should actually have um, 38 and a half years uh, loved rather than 60 years. But the, the serious statement is that the quality of those 21 and a half years of sleep will, I hope to convince you, uh, influence profoundly the 38 and a half years you've been interacting with others. <clears throat> it's also worth bearing in mind um, the way we think about sleep now and then. Um, so here's Thomas Edison. He was indeed a genius. He didn't discover the electric light bulb, but he commercialized it. And with the commercialization of electric light, we as society could move into the night cheaply and safely for the first time. And the fact that we did invade the night meant that sleep was the first victim. And as a consequence of moving into the night, we've tended to marginalize sleep. We've, we've, we've regarded it as some sort of indulgence, some sort of a luxury. And indeed, Edison's view about sleep is encapsulated in this statement. Sleep is a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our cave days. And I think still, that is the attitude of very many people indeed. But you just have to contrast this industrial view, and particularly the one that, that has dominated the 20th and now in the 21st century, with the pre-industrial era. Those of you who will be familiar with Shakespeare uh, can think of the sonnets and the plays where there are so many wonderful allusions to sleep. Enjoy the honey-heavy dew of slumber. O oh, sleep, O oh, gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee? Just beautiful, embracing words about sleep. And indeed, Thomas Decker, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare, I said, you know, wrote absolutely prophetically, sleep is, a go is the golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. And how right he was. And that's what I'm going to try and illustrate over the remaining uh, time we have together this evening. So, the quality of our consciousness is largely defined by the quality of our sleep. And let me show you what evidence we've got for that. So, what's going on within the sleeping brain that is so important to our ability to function during the wake state and, and consciousness? And I'll just illustrate three um, aspects in a little bit of detail. So, our ability to lay down memories, to take in information during the day and consolidate that information into a, into a memory. But it's not just the development of, of, of factual learning, as it were, but there's also the processing of information, how we begin to manipulate that information and make use of it, but also 
our state of tiredness very much um, influences the sorts of things we tend to remember. So let me illustrate those three aspects of what's going on whilst we sleep and deal, first of all, with information processing. Now, this is a study from Jan Bourne's group, and it's an absolutely classic one from 2004. And what Jan's group did was develop a task um, which you had to solve. It's a problem-solving task. I won't bore you with the details. And the first group, he introduced these individuals to the task in the morning, and then they were asked to perform the task in the afternoon. And about 20% solved the problem. They got it. The second group, he introduced them to the task in the morning. They performed it the next afternoon, but they were kept up all night. They had no sleep. And again, about 20% um, were able to solve the problem. So he nicely controlled for fatigue here. There was, it wasn't worse in this group. This is the most interesting group, of course. He introduced uh, the task in the morning. They performed it the next afternoon, but they were allowed to sleep normally and the percentage of individuals who were then able to solve the task went to greater than 60%, showing that, uh, when well, this is a highly statistical result, showing that sleep promotes the ability to come up with novel solutions to complex problems. And indeed, anecdotally, we hear time after time that you've you know, woken up after sleeping on a problem and you've solved it. I mean, many of us have experienced this. Another, I think, really interesting area is sleep memory and emotion. This is a study from Walter Sickold's group. And there are two groups of individuals here, those that had normal sleep, and one group who were deprived of sleep for one night. So in total, they had not slept for 36 hours. And the two groups were asked to remember names, uh, words rather, with a different sort of emotional content. So positive words, love, joy, happiness, that kind of stuff. Negative words, war, hate, crime. Trump. Uh, <coughs> sorry, that was a low, below the belt um, uh, 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 comment. And then neutral words. And I went back to the paper because I wondered what a neutral word was. And it's things like cotton. Now, if you come from Lancashire, I'm sure cotton isn't a neutral word. But anyway, that was considered to be a neutral word. So if you look at all the words together, you see that uh, this is all relative to each other. So you see that that the ability to remember words after sleep deprivation had dropped very significantly. And that was a significant finding. But then, this is the fascinating stuff, when we carve the data up on the basis of the, the, well, the positive, negative, or neutral emotional content, the neutral, uh, yes, there was a, there was a trend to, to, to not to remember those neutral words as well, but it wasn't significant. The negative words, again, there was a trend, but it wasn't significant. So people were perfectly able to remember the bad stuff. But look at this. The failure to remember um, words with a positive content had absolutely plummeted. And much of this was due to the failure to remember positive words. And so what you've got there is that one's state of brain tiredness, if you like, very much um, reflects what you remember. So tired people tend to remember the negative stuff rather than the positive stuff. Okay, in addition to the brain's uh, processing power, if you like, the brain is also regulating a mass of other types of physiology. The removal of waste products. Some of you may have heard of the misfolded protein beta amyloid. And there's pretty good evidence now that in individuals who have sleep disruption and poor quality sleep, the levels of this misfolded protein within the cerebral spinal fluid have gone up. Why is that important? Well, it, uh, the beta amyloid has been linked to the development of Alzheimer's and dementia. Now, I'm not saying that poor sleep will cause dementia and Alzheimer's, but we have evidence that poor sleep will actually contribute to the process that does lead to dementia and Alzheimer's. We talked about uh, brain regulating growth and repair. It's regulating the release of that growth hormone, which is very much occurring during sleep. Uh, replacing energy reserves, rebuilding metabolic pathways. So much of our ability to function is dependent upon a night of sleep. And in view of the amount of time spent asleep and the complexity of all the processes going on, it's no great surprise that the sleep-wake um, process uh, 
involves an interaction of all the key brain neurotransmitters, whether it be dopamine, GABA, glutamate, they're all involved in this sleep-wake process. And, of course, it's multiple brain structures and multiple interactions. The hindbrain, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and, of course, the cortex are all interacting to drive this state of consciousness um, and sleep. Now, that flip-flop between sleep and wake is uh, regulated, is timed by a series of important processes. The first is uh, circadian timing, if you like, the biological clock. The second is the intuitive part about sleep, and that's sleep pressure, and we'll go into that. In our own species, there's also societal pressures. So let's look at what this clock in the brain actually constitutes, this circadian timing clock. If we look in the anterior part of the brain here, right at the, the, the base of the brain in the hypothalamus, there's the most extraordinary structure, perhaps the most beautiful structure in the brain, I would argue, um, called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Um, it's often been called the master clock. It comprises, uh, it sits here, it comprises of, in us, about 50,000 individual clock cells. That's what's so extraordinary. You can take one of those cells out, put it in a dish, and you can see that it will show 24-hour oscillations in the production of protein and other biological processes. So the clock is a subcellular molecular process, which is amazing. Um, this internal clock is, of course, no use to us unless it's set to the external world. And the classic mismatch between internal time and external time is jet lag. We eventually get over jet lag primarily as a result of exposure to the light-dark cycle, as detected by the eye, and we'll talk about those processes uh, fairly shortly. Okay. What does the clock consist of? And I'm just going to show you a cartoon to give you some sense of this. Um, and what you've got are some key genes, the per genes and the cry genes, and they have a regulatory element in their, in their gene. And they are activated by a bunch of proteins, and it turns on the production of a message for the protein, and those messages are turned into a protein. The proteins then interact to form a complex. That protein complex then moves into the nucleus and blocks the action of these proteins, so you then turn off any more production. Those proteins are then degraded in the cytoplasm, in the complex, and then in the nucleus, and the whole thing kicks off again. So what you have at the core of this circadian rhythm, this 24-hour oscillation, is the production and the degradation of proteins. And that's, in essence, what the clock is. And, of course, um, Hall, Ross, Rossbash, and Young uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering how this basic clock worked in fruit flies, and, and that happened last year. Okay, and of course it's that signal that's driving circadian rhythms and physiology and behavior. And the point that I think is becoming highly relevant is that changes in those clock genes are being linked to particular morning and evening sleep types. So, so whether you're a morning type or an evening type can be profoundly influenced by your genetics. So by their contribution to our genes, our parents are still telling us what time to go to bed and get up, broadly speaking. There are other things that define morningness and eveningness, but genetics is an important point. So here we see an example of that. Here's a normal sleep-wake pattern, um, and so this is a vaguely normal individual. They're going to bed a little bit later at the weekends, uh, here and here. We see a classic delayed evening type. Again, getting up and going to bed really late, and poor things are oversleeping at the weekends, but the alarm clock is driving them out of bed on work days. And then the advanced sleep type, the morning types or the larks, uh, are, are getting up early. But, but look at the weekend. They're going to bed later, because so many of their friends are delayed types, saying, no, 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 you've got to stay up, you've got to party. And, and, and morning types hate the weekend, because they're forced to stay up late when they really want to go to bed. Okay, so we've talked about the influence of the circadian system and the body clock, but there's another really important timer, and that's called sleep pressure, also called the homeostat. And it's the intuitive part of sleep, and it's been depicted here by this sort of egg timer. And what it represents is the longer you've been awake, the greater the buildup of sleep pressure and the greater the need for sleep. So what we see is the interaction between the master circadian clock and sleep pressure. And these two interact in the following way. 
So we've got sleepiness on this axis here, and we see that from the moment we wake, the sleep pressure rises and rises and rises, and then when we're asleep, the sleep pressure <coughs> dissipates. But you see that at this point here, sleep pressure is really high. So for you lot, your sleep pressure will be really, really high. You've been awake all day, probably, um, but you hopefully won't be falling to sleep because of the action of the biological clock. What the circadian system is doing is essentially providing a drive for wakefulness. So the wakefulness drive is low here because the sleep, sleepiness drive is low. But as we go through the day, when the sleepiness drive increases, the wakefulness drive keeps us awake. It's only as we approach sleep, the wakefulness drive diminishes, and then during sleep, the wakefulness drive is low, but then as we approach morning, the wakefulness drive kicks in, and we wake up somewhere here. And the interaction of these two processes, of course, explains why, if you wake up during the first half of the night here, it's easy to get back to sleep, because the sleep pressure is high, and the wakefulness drive is low. But if you wake up here, the sleep pressure is diminished, and the wakefulness drive is kicking in, and that's why it's so much more difficult to go back to sleep at that point. There's also major societal pressures. So if you are a shift worker, an airline pilot, then this uh, homeostatic drive and circadian drive are completely disrupted. So you don't get the beautiful alignment of these two systems. So sleep is immensely disrupted in those individuals. It's also disrupted increasingly in our 24-7 society where we're driving things like wakefulness with caffeine. Caffeine actually blocks the receptors that allow us to respond to this sleepiness drive here. So we can actually feel more awake by drinking a cup of coffee because we're actually blocking the brain's ability to respond to that sleepiness drive there. So it's immensely complicated. Let's deal with one critical aspect of all this, which is the regulation of the system by light. So for that, you need an eye, which is setting the clock to the external world. And this is the retina, and here we see the rods and cones, the visual cells, and these are the inner cells of the retina. These are the ganglion cells whose projections give rise to the optic nerve and allow light information to pass from the eye into the brain. Now, what we're able to... to oh, yes, and this is an example of how important the eye is. This is an individual with eyes, normally sighted. Here's midnight, this red line. And you see two days plotted. And this is where this individual was active. So you see that they're active beyond midnight. Um, and they're getting up. It's a fairly wobbly get up, but it's a fairly stable rest activity profile. It's an individual who is unemployed. By contrast, here's somebody who's lost their eyes as a result of um, a trauma. And you see that this individual is failing to show this aligned rest activity. In fact, they're drifting through time. So without the eyes, you cannot set the internal sleep-wake profile to the external world. So here's the retina again, and what we discovered a few years ago now is that if you don't have any visual cells, you can still regulate your clock perfectly normally. There's another light sensor within the eye, and it's based upon a group of light-sensitive or photosensitive ganglion cells. These are directly light-sensitive, and they send that information into the master clock within the brain. That's true for mice, and we, and other groups, and in fact, uh, 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 Beth is in the audience, she, and, uh, um, uh, oh, what's your name? I've forgotten. Um, what? <laughs> Ken Wright. Um, Ken, of course, have been very much, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, it's been a long day. And Ken were very much involved in also showing that these systems are active in the humans as well. Um, so, the important point is you can be visually blind, have no visual responses at all, and not be clock blind if those cells are still working. I'm sorry, Ken. Um, <laughs> he put on a tie, especially for this evening, too. I feel really mean. Um, this, yes, this is what these cells look like. Um, these are in a mouse, and you see these lovely cell bodies, and essentially these light-sensitive processes you know, that extend the arc of the eye. I couldn't help but show you these wonderful new images that Steve Hughes has got. These are from a sheep. I won't explain what we're doing with sheep, um, other than the fact that they have these most wonderful photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And it's based upon a blue light sensitive molecule called melanopsin, or OPN4. 
Um, and we might want to deal with this uh, during the question time. How much light do we need? Well, it's really interesting. We live in an amazingly dynamic light environment, going from 0 0.01 lux all the way to 100,000 lux. So moonlight, candlelight, sunset. Office lighting is about three to 400 lux, so relatively low. Um, near a window, you might be lucky enough to get 3,000 lux. Shade outside, 10,000 lux. It's probably about 10,000, 12,000 lux outside now. But on a bright, sunny day, even in Oxford, you can get to 100,000 lux. So it's very dynamic. Now, the really important thing is that the rods, which give us our sense of black and white vision, are sensitive, oops, sorry, sensitive in this range here, um, the low light levels, the cones give us our sensitivity to color vision, and they're perfectly able to function uh, in, this, in this area here. Uh, but those light-sensitive ganglion cells, cells, on average, need much more light. So we need a robust light signal to set the clock to external time. Um, this illustrates the fact that uh, for most domestic settings, color vision is fine. We can do color vision, but we're on the edges of being able to set the clock to the external world. And not enough light can be a problem. This is a, a study from a, a colleague, Als van Summeren, and he looked at light in the nursing home. And um, he went in, and he was horrified by the fact, this is at uh, 20 past 2 in the afternoon, and you see that these individuals are sitting in a room with 20 lux. Bearing in mind, for robust entrainment, you need to be high hundreds, thousands of lux then this is a very dim light environment. So what ALS did was increase the amount of light in the living spaces to about 2,000 lux. So he installed these big light banks. And what he showed, this is the pattern of activity and rest before. And you see it's a pretty ragged profile. But after he installed the lighting, after the 2,000 lux, we see a beautiful, stable, rest activity profile, not in all, but in very many of those individuals. And critically, patients with dementia or mild dementia show, showed improved stability of their sleep-wake rhythms, an increase in their cognition, and a decrease in their levels of depression, and a much greater ability to deal with the demands of, uh, uh, of living, a uh, greater sense of well-being. So here's a good example where changing the light environment can change the robustness of sleep-wake, which then translates into our ability to function. This is, a, I think, a really important area because what we said earlier, of course, is that you can be visually blind. You've lost your rods and cones as a result of some genetic defect, but you need not necessarily be clock blind. The eye is doing two things. And what we have started to ask is what is the impact of eye disease on human sleep-wake biology. And this is a set of experiments led by Susie Downs, who's a consultant in the eye hospital here in Oxford. And we've looked at the impact of a whole range of different eye conditions on sleep-wake timing and sleep-wake health, if you like. And I won't bore you with all the details, but you can summarize the data into two broad groups. There are patients with visual cell loss because they carry a genetic defect, for example, whereby the rods and cones have been largely lost. But they still have their photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And what they should be being told is, OK, you can't see. You're visually blind. But what I really want you to do is get out and expose your eyes to sufficient daytime light to regulate your sleep-wake timing. For the other group, of course, there's different sorts of retinal disease, and in these individuals, their rods and cones are there, but they suffer inner retinal cell loss. So there's no way the rods and cones can talk to the brain, and they've lost many of those light-sensitive ganglion cells. There's not a huge amount you can do for those individuals. Medications such as melatonin can sometimes fool the clock into thinking it's seen light, and if there's time, I'll show you, oh gosh, about some new drugs that we're working on, which um, we hope will provide that light signal again uh, to replace, essentially, to fool the eye, uh, to fool the brain into thinking it's seen light. So clinical ophthalmology must appreciate that the eye provides us with both our sense of space, our sense of vision, but also our sense of time as a result of its regulation of the internal clock. And we're talking worldwide a large number of people.
there are 39 million people who are profoundly blind, 285 million with severe visual impairment, and 246 million worldwide with low vision. And these individuals would benefit hugely by knowledge of how to stimulate those resi residual photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Okay, my goodness, I am running out of time. So I need to sort of speed up and talk about the impact of sleep disruption. What we talked about here was complexity. Um, and this complexity means that the whole system is extremely vulnerable to disruption. Abnormal light exposure, drinking too much coffee, shift work, all the rest of it can screw up the system profoundly. So huge complexity. And sleep and circadian rhythm disruption can operate at three broad domains. The first, I guess, would be sort of short-term disruption. Loss of attention, high levels of microsleeps, the failure to process information appropriately, increased impulsivity, loss of empathy, failing to pick up those social signals in others, a negative focus, we talked about that, impaired memory, increased mistakes, reduced cognition and creativity. We've all experienced this as a result of relatively short-term sleep disruption. Longer-term sleep disruption, the sort that you see in long-term shift work, 15 to 20 years, for example, you see immune suppression, and it may be that immune suppression that is increasing the risks of infection and cancer. In night shift nurses in Dana, D Denmark, there's that famous study showing high risks of colorectal cancer and breast cancer, increased cardiovascular disease, diabetes 2, other metabolic abnormalities, and in in indeed increased stimulant and sedative use long term. And then finally, individuals who have mental illness vul vulnerability, um, sleep disruption can uh, exacerbate mood instability, increase anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations, and indeed increase the severity of bipolar and schizophrenia uh, conditions. If we look at a few examples, 100,000 crashes on the American freeway every year have been related to microsleeps, this catastrophic falling asleep at the wheel. The Air India, 2010 Air India crash uh, is a particularly tragic example of uh, the pilot um, who fell asleep. He was actually landing and he just fell asleep. Um, this little kid, um, thank goodness, survived this horror. Um, how do we know that the pilot had fallen asleep? Well, we could hear um, snoring on the flight recorder in the cockpit. He just fell asleep in the middle of it. Um, this is a nice study showing uh, the uh, fully rested brain and the various areas of the brain that are lighting up uh, as a, uh, whilst performing mathematical tasks. This is the same individual after sleep deprivation. And you see that's the level of brain activation. So you see an incredible change in the ability of the brain to um, process information. And the problem is it's brains like that that then indulge in conditions like this. So the alarm clock drives you out of bread, bed, and perhaps the first or second thing you do is seek out stimulants. So caffeine, of course, as we've already discussed, and a very effective stimulant. If you're a really naughty, tired brain, you go for the ciggies and the nicotine. Um, but the problem is, things like caffeine last in the body for quite a long time. They have a half-life of five to eight hours, five to nine hours, in fact. So if you fuel the waking day with lots and lots of caffeine, then you need to counteract that when you want to go to bed at night. So there's a tendency to take sleeping tablets or sedate yourself with alcohol. And the key thing to be aware of is that these do not provide a biological mimic of sleep. They sedate you. They do not pro provide the complete replication of sleep. So what happens is that some of the processes that we've talked about, memory consolidation, for example, is actually in impeded, particularly by things like alcohol. So you wake, whoops, so you wake from this, this um, uh, sedation, and you have more stimulants and more sedatives. And so the stimulant sedative feedback loop is, a, I think, a, a terrible feature of much of the developed and the developing world. In our kids, we see the use of Red Bull and Pro Plus uh, driving the waking day, and then over-the-counter antihistamines, which class the blood blame barrier, such as Phenagon, an incredibly effective sedative in many people, or stealing parental alcohol. And this is a very serious issue, which I don't think we are, um, uh, are taking uh, this su sufficiently seriously. Appetite is profoundly influenced by sleep disruption. 
Under normal circumstances, the stomach releases ghrelin, which essentially acts as the hunger hormone, reaches the brain, and promotes appetite and weight gain. Normally, um, the gut and the adipose tissue is producing a hormone called leptin, which has been called the satiation hormone, and that kind of counteracts the effects of ghrelin. So, so these sort of the hunger uh, and, and, and satiation are in normal uh, balance. Um, and I should say, this is actually me, uh, 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 before and after, uh, uh, giving up chocolate hobnobs. Uh, anyway, um, the problem is that, um, I don't think there's any need to be quite cruel in your laughter there. Um, uh, the problem is, is that sleep disruption hugely distorts the seesaw to the production of ghrelin and the downregulation of leptin. So tired people are producing more ghrelin, they are more hungry, they are predisposed to weight gain. And the final example is activation of the stress axis. Sleep disruption has a big uh, uh, effect upon long-term stress hormone release, both cortisol and adrenaline. Of course, short-term activation of this axis is great. It's the fight or flight response. But the problem is, if you have sustained activation of this axis, then you are more vulnerable to heart disease, stroke, metabolic problems, reduced immunity, stomach ulcers, abnormal digestion, anxiety, mood instability and depression, and impaired memory. So this, uh, this long-term activation of this axis is particularly profound after sleep disruption. Okay, so let me um, just talk briefly about mental illness and this extraordinary relationship uh, between mental illness and sleep disruption. This is a study that was published in 2011 showing that those individuals um, who were in psychiatric, um, uh, who were psych psychiatric inpatients uh, complained of uh, uh, insomnia, some form of sleep disruption. Uh, the statistics suggest 80%. In our um, observations, it's, it will be greater than that. It will be closer to 100%. Now, we've known about this kind of disruption for a very long time. This is Emil uh, Kraepelin, the father of psychiatry, and he talked about sleep disruption in conditions that we would call today schizophrenia, way back in the 1830s. But um, we jump ahead to the 1970s and the introduction of the antipsychotic medications, and um, this disruption was simply viewed as merely the byproduct of the medication, forgetting the fact that for 100 years previously, people have been reporting sleep weight dis disruption. It was just attributed to the, the, a side effect of the medication. Now, the medication may be influencing it, but it is not driving it. If it wasn't the medication, then abnormal sleep in schizophrenia, for example, was dismissed on the basis of a lack of work. And this is a, a quote, this is what got me into this, by a psychiatrist in a lift in Charing Cross Hospital, and he said, my patients can't hold down a job, so no wonder they get up late, miss my clinic, and don't have friends. We thought that was absolute bloody nonsense. So what Katerina Wolf and I did was to ask how bad is sleep and circadian rhythm disruption in schizophrenia. This is the pattern that we saw earlier from this unemployed individual. This is a stable, here we are, uh, this is midnight, and these are uh, the particular, uh, this is melatonin, the peak of melatonin, which is showing, which is occurring at the same time day after day. What was so breathtaking about the patients with a diagnosis of schizophrenia was the profound disruption. So this is perhaps one of the best individuals we saw, lots of activity occurring after midnight, very, very unstable. This individual was drifting through time. Here's somebody with a, with a, who's just about, they were going to bed late and getting up, but it was kind of stable, and then it fell apart, excuse me, and then, again, somebody falling apart, and this person had no 24-hour rhythms at all. These rhythms were utterly, utterly smashed. So, why? And suppose, with those observations and the knowledge of the complexity of the neuroscience of sleep, we wondered whether sleep disruption and mental illness share overlapping brain circuits and neurotransmitter systems. So if you have a defect in a neurotransmitter system that predisposes you to mental illness, that's a defect in the dopamine pathway, for example, we know that dopamine is also very important in normal sleep. So it's going to have an impact upon the sleep-wake system at some level. Furthermore, of course, because sleep disruption has this big global effect, 
on, the, on, on distorting our normal biology. It could be that that distorted biology could exacerbate some of the symptoms of mental illness. And of course, mental illness may feed back and disrupt uh, sleep even further. But this then became testable. So we asked a series of questions. So we said, well, if you, let's take some genes that have been link, linked to mental illness. Will they also affect, sleep, affect the sleep and the clock systems? So we took genes that have been linked to human schizophrenia, mutated those genes in a mouse, and showed that for many of those genes, you disrupt sleep-wake in a mouse, showing that there is genuinely an overlap between these two systems. And of course, you'd argue in the same way that genes that are linked to the clock and sleep will also affect mental illness. And increasingly, we're finding an association between classical clock genes and um, uh, uh, an association with various forms of mental illness. So there's good evidence for that component there. Furthermore, if the mental illness isn't simply causing the sleep disruption, we, and there's an overlap, we might see sleep disruption prior to any clinical diagnosis of mental illness. And indeed, that's what we see. So does sleep disruption precede a clinical diagnosis of mental illness? In some cases, it does. These are individuals, young individuals, who are at high risk versus low risk of bipolar. So this shows the lovely pattern here. Here's midnight. Here's the activity. Here's sleep, beautifully aligned. This is an individual who is at high risk of developing bipolar condition. They haven't got bipolar. They do not have a clinical diagnosis of bipolar, but they're at risk of developing it. And you already see a breakdown in the beautiful sleep-wake biology. And then finally, and we're almost done. If anybody needs to leave, I'm sorry I'm overrunning slightly. What about the last bit? What about if we can stabilize sleep? Will we reduce the severity of psychiatric symptoms here? And this is a paper that was led by Dan Freeman in, in the psychiatric department here in Oxford. And essentially, he used an approach to stabilize sleep-wake in a bunch of individuals who were vulnerable uh, to uh, paranoia and hallucinatory experiences. This is the control group. This is the level of hallucinatory experiences before. And these individuals were part of the trial, but they did not have an intervention which helped their sleep. This is the group who had an intervention which helped and improved their sleep. And what was so striking is that with improved sleep, you see a big reduction, a very statistical reduction in the degree, the severity of paranoia. And that was true for both paranoia and hallucinatory experiences. So what I think these data are telling us, by studying mental illness and sleep disruption in parallel, we're getting better understanding of the mechanisms and how these me mechanisms interact and, in, and interrelate. We are getting some idea that we can use sleep and sleep disruption as a potential biomarker. And why that's important is if you have early diagnosis, you have the chance of early intervention. And that's what is one of the key drivers in mental uh, treatments at the moment, mental health treatments at the moment. And then finally, and perhaps most excitingly, you can think about the sleep systems as a new therapeutic target. Stabilize sleep-wake, and it looks like you can reduce the severity of the mental, mental illness. So that's the way we're working on that. And, okay, finally, new therapeutics, and I promise this is just a few slides. <laughs> Thank God, they're all saying. Um, here's our normally sighted individual. Here's our person who's lost their eyes. What the hell are we going to do about this? What can we do to restore some stability to the sleep-wake timing? Can we use our knowledge of how light interacts with the molecular clock to help? And so here's our pattern again. Here's those light-sensitive ganglion cells. Here's the master clock. And we can see here's those ganglion cells, and they're talking to individual clock cells. And we know that light will shift the clock. More light will shift the clock further. So the logic was, OK, why don't we look at what's going on here? What's going on that's, that's actually interacting with the clock? And could we develop a drug that would, in turn, shift the clock? And the exciting news is, we can. We've got some drugs that potentially can fool the clock that it has seen light. And it's a great honor and privilege to work with the Blind Veterans Association of the UK 
because they're an organization that reached out to us, and we're now working with them, and the hope is that we can restore our, a sense of time to those individuals who've tragically lost their eyes as a result of combat, um, uh, these, anti these vile anti-personnel devices. So, so that's one of the ways in which we are translating our fundamental biology and the understanding of how light is interacting with a molecular clockwork to develop drugs to help individuals such as the blind veterans. So we can indeed use our knowledge of how light interacts with a molecular clockwork to help the profoundly blind. Okay. What I hope I've given you a sense of in the last hour, I can't believe I've gone on for an hour, I do apologize. It was, it was, uh, it was Martha's hugely long introduction, I think, that caused it. <laughs> was, gave you sort of some sense of the overview of circadian rhythms, and actually their importance, and the way we should be using the fact that, 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 that our biology is, is constantly dynamic, and the knowing about that dynamic biology can help everything from the design of when we should take our drugs um, to perhaps the way we should be testing our drugs. We talked about the biology of sleep and circadian rhythms, how these systems are interacting, and the really phenomenal advances that have been made in this field over the past 20 years, the importance of light, and pure curiosity-driven research is how does the eye detect light to regulate internal time, led to the discovery of a completely new photoreceptor system and is redefining our understanding of blindness. The fact that sleep disruption is having it's just not the inconvenience of, of feeling sleepy at the wrong time, but it's having profound short-term and long-term effects upon our health. And we must begin to take this profoundly seriously. And then we ended up with the extraordinary relationship between mental illness um, and sleep weight disruption, how it might be coming about. And then ultimately, thinking about how we can use our biology to develop new therapeutics. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> And we have a microphone um, also to, to help you yeah. convey your questions. Absolutely. I mean, Ken Wright has been doing some beautiful work in there. Ken, I mean, I think you should probably answer this. I mean, but you're absolutely right, it does. But here we've got one of the experts in the world on this topic. So, Ken, please tell us a little bit. So, as, as Professor Foster mentioned, uh, indeed, when we don't get enough sleep, it alters certain hormones that drive our, our hunger and our appetite. Um, it also increases our energy expenditure when we eat more and more things. Um, we know that time of day that you intake food contributes to your risk of weight gain. And when we don't get enough sleep, we tend to eat more, especially after dinner at night. And we, and we know from studies of uh, the big population studies that the more you eat at night after dinner, increases, significantly increases your risk of weight gain. So that's eating at a time when the clock is not ready for food. Yeah. So those things together uh, certainly can lead to uh, weight gain over time. And it affects the risk of diabetes too. Yes, but, but you have to give her a drink. Um, <laughs> any further questions? Yes, at the back. There's a microphone on its way. <clears throat> I was, while you were talking about the mental health thing, I just wondered about suicide. Is there any, is, or is there much research done on what time of day or night people commit suicide? And um, I can see there'd be other, lots of other factors coming yeah. in as well. I, I mean... Uh, so others here might be able to address time of day. There are certainly mood changes that vary over the day, which I suspect are correlated with suicide, although it's kind of difficult sometimes to get the precise time of suicide. 
Where we do have some very interesting data is the seasonal um, change in suicide. And it's very surprising because in the Northern Hemisphere, the peak in suicides is April, May. It's not in the deep winter. More people are ringing the Samaritans during the deep winter, but they're not actually committing suicide. And we don't really understand why. And it may be associated with light. Um, one of the thoughts is that light is doing two things. It's increasing one's mood, you're feeling better, but it's through reasons, through, through mechanisms I don't have time to go into, but also it's changing your levels of energy and your capacity to do stuff. But these two don't work in, in parallel. And in fact, the light, the increasing day lengths in the spring is increasing energy levels, but you're remaining depressed. And so therefore, you've got then the energy to do something about your depression. And certainly when you talk to the seasonal affective disorder group, they, and I was asking them, why isn't there more suicide in this group? And they say, you don't understand. The sad is so profound, we don't have enough energy to actually plan and execute a suicide attempt. So I think there's some very interesting issues about depression, both um, um, as mood varies over the day, but also as, as suicide and mood changes over the seasons as well. And that's a whole other topic that I will, we'll try and organize a public lecture on. Yeah. So actually, there are more suicides yeah. um, late night, early morning, especially once you adjust for the number of people that are awake yeah. at, at that time. Um, that was done by Michael Perlis at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Beth. And then there's a group of uh, students from Sondheim, which I talked to you afterwards, and they're very engaged in uh, mental health and the Canadian Cross. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for reminding me that in my married life, I've lost something like 30% <laughs> of yeah, contribution to, to happiness. I'm sorry to have singled you out there, but, but you're behind that. <laughs> notwithstanding that, the, import, the importance of light. Here, here we are approaching the winter. The intensity of the lux, or the, the amount of lux in daylight will, have, will be going down. Yep. What do you think is a significant time for exposure to daylight to make any real difference to sleep quality? Um, so one of the slides I actually took out was, was the impact of daily <clears throat> light exposure from a light box, which was half an hour of light exposure first thing in the morning. And it compared that daily light exposure um, with uh, taking a Prozac. And what was so striking is that that 30 minutes of 10,000 lux from a light box was much more effective than Prozac in reducing the levels of non-seasonal depression. So, um, and my, my colleagues here, I'm sure, will want to say additional information, but certainly morning light, bright morning light, has been shown to alleviate some of the effects of depression and is also important in stabilizing uh, some of the sleep-wake timing as well. Team, I mean, Ken's done some great work on light. Uh, Beth, would you like to add anything? Um, so, so, yes, it's, been, it's, it's a very, very nice data showing that people who own a dog have better sleep-wake patterns and overall health. And part of the argument has been it's because they're getting out, they're getting that morning light exposure, which is so important for setting the clock. And it does seem in changing uh, mood. What those mechanisms are, how light is actually influencing mood and depression, we don't know what the mechanisms are. We can guess, but we don't know. Do you have any comments on naturally occurring short daytime sleeps at the age of 68? I find an hour and 10 minutes in the afternoon is great, and then six, six and a half hours at night. Yeah, I mean, napping is intriguing. And, and again, my, I'm sure my colleagues would want to interject at some point. But, but what we know is that a short 20-minute nap uh, in the early afternoon has been shown to improve one's ability to function uh, during the second half of the day. The danger with napping, and it's particularly a problem with teenagers, is that if you have a longer nap, first of all, you can go into deeper sleep, and so the recovery from that, that deeper sleep can be somewhat counterproductive. But what a nap will do is push back the sleep pressure, and that will mean that you'll then go to bed later at night. 
Now, for most of us, I mean, particularly for the retired, it really doesn't matter. But for teenagers, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're going to bed very, very late. The alarm clock is driving them out of bed. They then struggle through school. They again back from, from, from school. Then they take a two-hour nap which then hugely dis uh, pushes back the sleep pressure, which means they delay sleep onset at night. So short naps, I think most of us would kind of feel, yes, okay. You don't want to get too dependent upon them, but it's nothing particularly bad. But it's where it starts to affect your consolidated nighttime sleep that I think there's a bit of a problem. That would be my view. Beth is going to add a greater wisdom. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In older people, if your bed partner says you snore loudly or won't even sleep with you anymore because you snore so loudly or if you stop breathing in the middle of the night, that may interfere with your ability to sleep at night and that's yeah. why we need a nap. And sleep apnea has been shown to have many adverse effects on yeah. heart, on blood pressure and many other things. So once again, if you are sort of okay sleeping at night, then I don't worry about a nap, but especially in older people, who have a higher incidence of sleep apnea and other sleep disorders, I would like to just make sure that yeah. they don't have a sleep disorder and that's why they're not getting sleep. I think that's extremely important because it could be a, um, a, a real warning of, of other global health problems, sleep apnea. Said by Beth, who is Professor Beth ah, yes, from Harvard. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Um, can you explain why some people need total darkness to sleep and some people can sleep with some light? And those that sleep with total darkness, even a pinprick of light, will wake them up. So we talked about light in terms of regulating the sleep-wake timing and, and those photoreceptors regulating the clock and the sleep systems. What we didn't talk about is the impact of light on increasing levels of alertness. Um, and so light will increase levels of alertness and therefore delay sleep onset at night, for example, or, or disrupt. Um, and so it's very likely that there are, there's a chain, that, that different people are sensitive to different intensities of light. There's some evidence, for example, that teenagers are more sensitive to light and therefore relatively low levels of light might actually increase their alertness and um, therefore disrupt their sleep. Uh, so whilst it's a phenomenon that there are different sensitivities and light can affect alertness, the mechanisms remain very poorly uh, understood at this stage. But it's a real phenomenon. Um, the only thing that I would add is that sometimes there can be sort of a psychological effect um, and that uh, you think, oh my God, I can see the light, this is, this, is, this is stopping me from getting to sleep, whereas actually physiologically it's probably not, but psychologically it is. So I think one has to sort of slightly disentangle the two. Thank you. Yes, put, again, put your hands up, students. Yep. Seek them out, oh, wow. abuse them with your questions, and then take them out for a drink. Um, okay. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.